So let's get this out of the way. Uh, I just shot a whole episode without realizing my hoodie was stained. So regardless of the reality of the situation, I will be moving forward with the argument that this is actually an artistic statement about the state of our world. Hmm, don't see it? Well, I guess maybe you're not smart. Like I. Big Brain DeFranco, starting the week on a high note. Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you had a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, otherwise I will punch you in the throat and let's just jump into it. First up today, let's talk about a batch of quickie news. So first up, we look to Texas where the governor has now issued a disaster declaration for Brazoria County. That, after the presence of a dangerous amoeba was detected in a city's water supply. That amoeba is called Nycleria foleri, and according to the CDC, the organism is typically found in warm freshwater lakes and rivers. People are exposed when it enters the body from the nose. From there, it travels to the brain where it destroys brain tissue. And officials are now aware of this issue because tragically, it was linked to the death of a six-year-old boy who passed away in the city of Lake Jackson earlier this month. It's believed he was exposed from the amoeba either from a water hose at his home or from a city splash pad. That then prompted testing and according to the governor's declaration, the presence of Nigleria foleri was identified in three of 11 tests of the water supply, posing an imminent threat to public health and safety, including loss of life. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality issued a do not use water alert for Friday for eight cities. We saw that warning lifted on Saturday for all cities in Brazoria County, except for Lake Jackson, with Lake Jackson remaining under a boil water advisory. And as of now, local officials say that they are working on a plan to flush and disinfect the water system. Then let's talk about everyone's favorite game when it comes to influencers, find the fake. With this round centering around a tweet that went viral over the weekend, exposing a secret behind some influencer travel photos. That tweet reading, I just found out LA Instagram girlies are using studio sets that look like private jets for their Instagram pics. It's crazy that anything you're looking at could be fake. The set the clothes, the body, I don't know, it just kind of shakes my reality a bit. That post, including photos of a private jet setup that's actually a studio in California, which you can rent for $64 an hour. Following this, we then saw influencers who had posed on this set being called out online. Perhaps most focused on here were the Mion twins, with them then eventually editing their Instagram captions to admit that they were on a set. And while a ton of people were upset about this, they thought it was hilarious and sad, you had others pointing out that it's not exactly a new idea. You have things in the past like Bow Wow, who famously was called out for posting a private plane photo on social media before being spotted on a commercial flight. People noting other ridiculous things like when people buy empty shopping bags to pretend that they've gone on a shopping spree. But the two main things I wanna hit on here, one, stop being fake, you fakers. And two, let this be your friendly DeFranco reminder that how people present themselves online is often different than what they are in real life. It's part of the reason why you should never compare yourself and your situation to what you see online. That's an artist's self-portrait, not reality. Then in entertainment news, we should talk about Sola El Whaley. And if you don't recall, she was a host on Bon Appetit's massively popular YouTube channel. And as Tube Filter noted, she was one of the first staffers to call out the publication's discriminatory compensation practices and lack of diversity on camera. She and a number of hosts left the channel, and what we're seeing this week is actually something very awesome. El Whaley has teamed up with the massive YouTube food sensation that is Binging with Babish. The Binging with Babish channel, which has been incredibly successful, just under 8 million subscribers as of right now. Several series, Binging with Babish, Basics with Babish, Being with Babish, has now been renamed and rebranded the Babish Culinary Universe, seemingly to allow shows to be launched that do not involve him. And the first that we saw is a new series titled Stump Sola, with Sola El Whaley doing at least a run of 10 episodes. And personally, I, I think this whole thing is actually very exciting. It appears like a win-win across the board. Sola was obviously a fan favorite over at Bon Appetit, so to see her then be able to move to a channel that's even larger, that's huge. And then you see Binging with Babish, right, Andrew Rea. Seeing him go from what was a small one-man operation to now this much bigger thing, that's exciting to see. That's, that's actual organic talent making big waves in the community. Then in entertainment news that goes political, we have The Rock. You've likely seen it by now, but you had Dwayne The Rock Johnson officially endorsing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And as far as if this actually moves any undecided voters, who can ever tell? But as far as my reaction to this announcement, I was actually genuinely surprised. And what I mean by that is I wasn't surprised that The Rock would be voting for Joe Biden. He put out that video back in June where he said, where is our leader while our country is on its knees? But there was still enough of a gray area in that video that you'd be like, ah, oh, this isn't gonna hurt him. But for The Rock, who is generally seen as successful because he's appealing to almost every person. Like him inserting himself in one of the most divisive elections that we've ever seen, that, that's bold and notable. You know, with this story, there are two questions in my mind. One, why is your shirt so tight, sir? It's aggressive, right? And two, I wonder what this endorsement does. Once again, like, does it move more people to go, oh, okay, even The Rock thinks this? Or, you know, does this hurt his career, or does it help his career in some way? You know, you look, following his endorsement, there are a lot of big reactions, a lot of love, a lot of hate. On his YouTube videos for this, the likes and dislikes are split. On Instagram, you see his post has a ton of likes, but a lot of the top comments are actually people speaking out against him. So I think it's likely we won't see for six to 12 months of, you know, did this hurt or help The Rock? Is it enough to make or break fans? But even saying that, it brings up another question of have we moved past a time of being apolitical? Right, do people expect their celebrities and their companies to stand for something? Right, like for example, in the, the corporate business world, 
world, one of the most notable examples is Nike and Colin Kaepernick. When that was announced, it appeared to be a very divisive moment, but you know, you look now and the company has just continued to grow, continued to succeed. Also in this story that's turning into just a, a number of questions, what are your thoughts around the argument that celebrities should just shut up when it comes to politics? What has your opinion on that been in the past? Has that changed since we literally have a celebrity president? Although celebrities in politics is not a new thing. I mean, Ronald Reagan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, does it depend on the person? But yeah, really any and all thoughts you have on that, uh, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below and also uh, the reasoning behind those opinions. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Keeps. You know, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35. Everyone's got that brother, uncle, or that friend. And if you don't wanna go down that road, you don't have to just sit idly by. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with their scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products that are out there. So some of you may have in fact already tried them before, but probably never at this price. You know, you used to have to go to the doctor's office for your prescription, but with Keeps, you can get these products delivered directly to your home. And fantastically, for a limited time, you beautiful bastards can get 50% off your order. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash DeFranco, or just click that link in the description down below to receive 50% off your first order. And the first bit of awesome today is actually a giveaway. I'll be selecting two lucky people from my text line, 813-213-4423, and two people from my private mailing list that you can join at shopdefranco.com to get a free one of these. I'm very bad at this. One of these. Or one of the short sleeves if you don't want to wear, uh, you know, hoodies every day, all day. I will continue to do so regardless of your choice. We had Will Smith doing a house tour of the Fresh Prince Mansion. You had Mr. Beast, would you rather have a giant diamond or $100,000, which, I mean this in a positive way, these videos now feel like a genuine TV show. You had Netflix putting out Father of the Bride Part 3-ish, with Netflix also putting out the full episode on their YouTube channel of Explained, Whose Vote Counts, John Cusack breaking down his most iconic characters. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared the secret link of the day, really anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. And the last thing that we're gonna talk about today, of course, is the major news around the Supreme Court. Right over the weekend, Donald Trump announced that he was nominating Amy Coney Barrett to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat. To give you a little background here, Barrett is a federal judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, a role that she has held since she was appointed by Trump back in 2017 after working as a law professor at Notre Dame. If she is appointed, which it seems incredibly likely, she will become the youngest member of the court at 48 years old. Trump's two other appointees, Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, which are both in their 50s, meaning the three Trump-appointed justices could potentially serve for decades. Also meaning you'd have a firm conservative Supreme Court with a six-person majority. Also, with Barrett's nomination, we've seen religion brought up. I was unaware of this, but her confirmation would mean that six of the nine justices are Catholic. And, you know, regarding her religion, you have some concern that her religious beliefs might impact her rulings. So you have others saying it's disgusting to criticize someone over their faith. Also, something regarding religion I wanted to note, in recent days, you have others raising questions about her and her husband's reported involvement in a Christian group called the People of Praise. According to reports that group, which is largely described as a Christian sect, grew out of the Catholic charismatic renewal movement that began in the late 1960s and adopted Pentecostal practices like speaking in tongues, belief in prophecy, and divine healing. Rainer alleged involvement with that group is why you saw The Handmaid's Tale trending on Twitter. This because some claim that the group was the inspiration for the original Handmaid's book, though that has been debunked. But Regardless, religion has been a big question for this justice specifically. And seemingly in response to those concerns, we saw Barrett for her part at the official announcement of her nomination say, I also want to acknowledge you, my fellow Americans. The president has nominated me to serve on the United States Supreme Court, and that institution belongs to all of us. If confirmed, I would not assume that role for the sake of those in my own circle, and certainly not for my own sake. I would assume this role to serve you. And that's something that Barrett also hit on when describing her personal judicial philosophy, which she said was the same as former Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who she actually clerked for and described as her mentor saying, His judicial philosophy is mine too. A judge must apply the law as written. Judges are not policy makers and they must be resolute in setting aside any policy views they might hold. And this idea that Barrett will follow closely in Scalia's footsteps is really important to the ongoing debate that we've been seeing. On one side, you have many people in media outlets saying, yes, she will shift the court, but she is ideologically in line with other conservative judges. But on the other side, you have a lot of others, and specifically you see this on social media, saying that her past decisions, public statements, and publications show that she is an extremist and a religious fundamentalist. And regarding those two sides, we've seen a lot of confusion over Barrett's record, where she stands on key issues, and how 
how that could affect future Supreme Court decisions. And as far as those key issues, first up, uh, a topic that possibly gets this video demonetized and suppressed, Roe v. Wade and abortion rights. Here, Barrett has been quite public about her personal opposition to abortion in both academic and judicial writings. She has explicitly said that abortion is always immoral and her nomination has been widely supported by anti-abortion groups. Also, in addition to her personal views and her role as a federal judge, she has overseen three cases regarding laws restricting abortions in her home state of Indiana. In all three of those cases, she expressed concerns over earlier rulings that had ended those restrictions, twice joining dissenting opinions that would have struck down lower court rulings and upheld abortion restrictions. But you have some arguing that both her personal beliefs and past rulings do not necessarily mean that she would strike down Roe v. Wade. Right, well, Trump vowed to appoint justices ready to overrule the 1973 decision that established that the Constitution recognizes a right to abortion. Barrett has not yet said publicly how she would rule on abortion if confirmed to the Supreme Court. And this is where things get a little messy. Barrett has in the past called Roe an erroneous decision and claimed that it ignited a national controversy by deciding the issue via the Supreme Court rather than leaving it up to the states. But at the same time, she has also repeatedly said she doesn't think SCOTUS would overturn the ruling. While speaking at an appearance in 2016, she stated, I don't think the core case, Roe's core holding that women have a right to an abortion, I don't think that would change. But I think the question of whether people can get very late term abortions, you know, how many restrictions can be put on clinics, I think that will change. Right, and that last point is really important because while many experts believe that it is unlikely that SCOTUS will wholesale overturn Roe anytime soon, what is very likely is that this court will make decisions on cases that will slowly chip away at the ruling instead. Though, understand, this is a point of debate because the conservative justices do have enough votes to go directly after abortion. And that's for a number of reasons, including that Barrett has been clear that she would be open to reversing a Supreme Court precedent if she believed it went against the Constitution. Right, so Roe v. Wade, one of the big things here, and in addition to that, you have the Affordable Care Act. And the timing with this one is incredibly significant because just a week after Election Day, the Supreme Court is set to hear arguments on the latest challenge to the ACA. And notably here, Barrett has publicly criticized the Supreme Court decision that upheld Obamacare as constitutional. In a 2017 article that she wrote, she quoted her mentor Scalia's dissension with the law by saying that it should be called SCOTUS care, with her argument being that an originalist reading of the Constitution would not allow for Obamacare. Also criticizing Chief Justice Robert's stance on Obamacare, saying that he considered too many factors outside of the Constitution when considering Obamacare's constitutionality. Also regarding the ACA making employers offer birth control regardless of their religious preferences. In 2012, she allegedly signed a petition against this provision and is quoted by Newsweek saying at the time, this is a grave violation of religious freedom and cannot stand. And this concern that a newly appointed Barrett along with the other conservative justices would be killing the ACA is something that we saw Biden speak on this weekend. This is about your health care. This is about whether or not the ACA will exist. This is about whether or not pre-existing conditions will be continued to be covered. This is about whether or not a woman can be charged more for the same procedure as a man. This is about people's health care in the middle of a pandemic. Also, with everything I just covered, I do want to note those are just two key points. It is very likely through the confirmation process, other things will be raised. Questions about her opinions and past choices regarding LGBTQ plus rights, immigration, maybe even stories related to this election. And there's been a lot of talk from people like Ted Cruz, President Trump, about getting this person on the court in case anything comes up with the vote. Which actually, regarding the timing, what happens next, Barrett will be meeting with senators for the next two weeks. Notably, that is much shorter than usual. Normally, lawmakers are given around six weeks to meet with and vet a SCOTUS nominee. But there, Republicans have argued that the quick turnaround is okay because Barrett has already been vetted by the Senate. Right, this because back in 2018, she was actually being considered for the SCOTUS seat that is now held by Brett Kavanaugh. After that two weeks, Republicans have scheduled four consecutive days of confirmation hearings starting October 12th with a full committee vote set for October 22nd, with of course their idea being to have a full floor vote before the election. Though, officially McConnell has not yet committed to a pre-election vote. And the question of will they or won't they regarding a pre-election vote, it, it's less about can they. They can, as of right now, it is more a matter of strategy. Right, ultimately the question of how will this impact voting? Pushing through the nominee before for election day, does that supercharge liberals or conservatives? And that's incredibly important because right now Republicans control the Senate, but there are a number of Republicans who are vulnerable right now. But at the same time, there is the very real situation that even if Republicans lose the Senate, they could still approve Barrett in the time after the election and before the new session in January. But for now, we have to wait and see not what will happen, but kind of the, the process that gets us to that end point. Because the power is where the power is right now, and that can only change if people go out and vote. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives into the news, supporting the show with likes, shares, whatever. Also, if you're new here, definitely hit that subscribe button, and hey, maybe text me at 813-213-4423. I'll make sure you get a notification for the show, sometimes behind the scenes stuff, cool opportunities. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.